Howdy, this is Mackenzie Franklin from Side Game LLC here in Colorado Springs, Colorado. And today is episode six of the What We've Been Playing series. This is where we take a look back at the last two weeks and talk about 10 games and give you some mini reviews on those games. Now we've played 39 different unique titles and during these last two weeks, and I'll go ahead and list them at the end of the video for you if you'd like to stay tuned for that. But we've played a lot of these games multiple times, so excited to talk about them and dive into them. Now before we begin, I do wanna say if you haven't subscribed to the channel already, please make sure that you have. It's the best way to help us grow. But that being said, let's get started. Now the first game I wanna talk about is Corrosion. This is a literal engine building game of turning wheels and triggering cards, as well as building all of these pieces in temporary engines. So this is a market style game where you have lots of different choices on your turn, then you'll get a lot of choices to pick from when resolving actions. So on your turn, you either play an action card and do what it says, and then other players will have a chance to follow by discarding cards of higher values. And then you also can move your wheel, which will trigger all the things that you've accumulated on your board, as well as reclaim those cards and corrode some of the materials as well as some machines that you've accumulated as well. Now the market system is something I really enjoy here. You have lots of choices on your turn. You have these turning machines that trigger every time you move your wheel. You have new assistants with special abilities, these one-time effects that'll get you extra points, as well as these nice fancy machines up here, which can give you points with an incentive system. These also trigger the end game and then some continuous effects when they're finally built. So I really like the market system in this game. And I also really like the steam system. Very similar similar to something like Gaia Project or Terra Mystica, you have these steam tokens in the form of water that during the game you can heat up. So it's a lot more simplified where to spend them you just simply push them back down. So it's a resource that you can get a larger capacity of and can be renewed based on the different abilities that you have. So I like this effects here and I like the way it works. Now the things that I don't really like about this game is honestly just the pacing of it. The game is very very long but that being said on your turn you feel like you're not doing a lot. On your turn you play a card, you do a small action, everyone has that opportunity to follow and that's really it and it takes a lot longer than it should for some reason, which I find very confounding because it seems like it should be very quick and fast. That's just not the experience, particularly in high player counts when there's a lot of opportunities to follow. The other thing that really kind of bugs me the wrong way is the following mechanism. You need to follow to stay competitive in the game, but it doesn't feel very good to follow. The highest value of cards are a little bit tricky to get. You have to spend some water and some victory points to claim them, and it feels really bad when you spend a very powerful card in order to take a subpar action just to get more actions on other players' turns. And then when that comes back to you, you're going to want to turn your wheel in order to get your cards back, and it just doesn't feel as awesome as it does. Now, that being said, there are some machines that can help mitigate these losses and make it so it's easier to reclaim cards, making following better, but you are kind of at the mercy of the decks of cards as well as the different machines that come out during each game. And those machines aren't going to be available for each player, so the experience is going to be different for each person. But overall, I do like Corrosion. I think it's a fun game. I particularly like the way that the lower player count games work, as well as the solo mode. I think it's it's very creative. You take all the cards that aren't being used, shuffle them together, and those are the action cards for the AI, and I think that's really well done. And I also really like the different goals and how achieving them first kind of sets you back a little bit, but gives you a temporary bonus as well, which I like. So there's some things to love in this game. I love acquiring new cards and getting cool abilities. I like building this engine and turning it and seeing all of these switches light up, but I think that the game length is a little wonky, and the actions don't feel as satisfying as I'd like in a game like this. So that's the first game I want to talk about was Corrosion. The next game I want to talk about is Bullet Orange, one of my favorite games from this year for sure. Uh, amazing real-time shoot 'em up bullet hell style game where you have all these little pieces coming at you and attacking. But this is the expansion for this. So Bullet Orange is the first expansion that comes with four new characters. And these characters all have very different play styles, which I really appreciate. You have some characters that have no abilities but have some crazy actions that you can use. You have some characters that are going to have the ability to get more weapons as the game progresses. And I really like this style of game. The Bosses are also challenging, and there's even a boss in here that has an infinite mode where it's like it's like hyperspeed. You're drawing like 20 bullets at a time to play against them. Super cool, super fun, super interesting. If you like bullet, get bullet orange. It's a no-brainer here. The, all the components are, are just cards and then they're boards, but they are double-sided to have those boss modes, and I think this is a great step for Bullet. I love that they're just introducing new characters and new ideas to the game. This is fantastic. I think it's been great. Played through all the characters. I think my favorite one to play as is you have this character that only has two cards in their hand, but whenever they use a pattern card, you can spend one of your action points to draw a new one. So it kind of allows you to chain for things and you become familiar with her cards. And so it's kind of neat to set up these cool combos. I'm having a great time with these. So that's Bullet Orange. Fantastic game. Up next, we have Glory to Rome. I had the opportunity to play this and I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a blast. We liked 
liked it so much we picked up a copy for the library so hopefully that'll be here in a couple of weeks but fantastic style of game very similar to games like race for the galaxy or san juan you are going to have the opportunity to do a lot of following as well as constructing your own empire in front of you with lots of super special abilities now i did not play the black box version i played the classic i think it's the 1.5 version this is hilarious the artwork is so funny everybody is super goofy in this and it definitely looks like this did not get a very good graphic design job but the gameplay is extremely solid now, the game i did play had one player ended very quickly which was unfortunate i did win the game that i did play but um, one of the characters cards had this ability where it just triggered the end so he was trying to push some strength and make sure that he was able to wrap up the game quickly but luckily had the cards to do so so the game itself has this cool mechanism where on your turn you play a card and then that card is one of six roles and those roles will do something to let you maybe hire clientels and that way you have additional effects when you follow another turns or your own you can also play cards that'll get you resources and those will go into your stockpile and i think one of the cool things that this game really does is it makes it so that you really care what other people are doing because a lot of the times when you play cards Every time you play a card, it goes in the center of the table and it becomes something that other people could claim, whether it be through that claim material action or laying foundations. There's lots of ways that people can interact with the cards that you are playing yourself, as well as on other players' turns when following your actions. There's some cool things in this game that really make it stand out from this other style of game, and I can see why it's so well loved. It is a blast to play, and I'm excited to try more of it. I think my game that I played was a little short lived, unfortunately, with that end game condition, but just a couple of turns in, I could see that the, the system's moving and I could see myself really enjoying and digging deep into this one. There's some cool solo play for it, so hopefully I'll get a chance to really dive in and explore all the different options, but I think that this is one that will come out quite a bit, especially when somebody knows how to teach the game well. So excited to play more World of Rome. I think this game is really cool, really fun, and I'm excited to explore more of those unique special buildings. The next game I want to talk about is Cultivate, a Kickstarter game all about bringing people into your cult. You play as the lead and you're going to have some sort of objective that says, hey, I need to get these people in this area, and each of these people are worth a different amount of points at the end. So politicians and celebrities are worth a lot, while kids and youngsters and hippies are not worth very much. So you pick your different orientation here, and if you get that pattern, you'll get some points. The easier patterns are worth less points, though, so you have to pick and choose what kind of path you want to go for. Now, this game is very much a take that game. On your turn, you are going to play a card, or you're going to trade people in your city. So the cards generally get you more people, or allow you to take things from other places, players, move pieces, a lot of take that nature actions that you're going to be doing. So whatever you can imagine in this space, that's exactly what's represented on this card. At the end of your turn, you'll draw back up to your hand size and then play continues until someone has fulfilled their city. Now, the things I like about this game, first off, I really like the art. I think that it's just a really well done game. It looks very pretty. I really like the way it's done here. I also like the special abilities on the bottom of your board. So each board has these four abilities here of specific colors. If you get a leader, one of your cult followers into there, they are going to be safe. They cannot leave. And then once you have someone there, you have a permanent effect from then on. It's kind of neat because you can tailor your strategy based on the different abilities you're getting. Some give you abilities to take extra actions when you do exchanges. Some give you just straight up extra points, give a bigger hand size. So you have some choices in how you want to customize. But the things that I don't like in this game are honestly just the gameplay. It's not very fun. It's not very satisfying. You're at the mercy of pretty much every player is and this is very much a heavy king making style game. And it's also extremely lucky. You can draw a hand of cards that don't do anything. You can draw a hand of cards that give you negative negative points just for drawing them on accident, then they fill your board with these investigators. You can also draw cards that negate other cards from being played, which is insane when you're trying to do something and you know you didn't draw any of these negate cards. So you're just at the mercy of this card draw to the T. So it's kind of, it's a very much what this game is going for, but it's not a game that I enjoy playing. I think that if you want a game that's like this, I would recommend Exploding Kittens. I think Exploding Kittens is perfect for this style of, hey, I'm drawing cards and playing them, but that is much more goofy, less fiddly with the components that you're taking, and it still has that great art from the oatmeal. So I think that if you're looking for a game like this, I would try Exploding Kittens. Smaller package, uh, but I do really like the art in this game, and I think that some people will like it based on this theme, but not gameplay that I'm really looking to play again. So unfortunately, that is Cultivate. Up next, we have Mandala, a two-player abstract game of card playing into two different areas. Now, this was recommended to me by Dan over at Chairman of the Board, and I'm glad that he did recommend it. I'm having a great time. 
time with it. So this game is a game of pattern collecting. So on your turn, you're going to be playing into three different areas. You can either play into the discard and draw new cards. You can play into one of these rings, and you can play in the center. And those are the cards that are going to be actually given to the players for winning those rings. And then we do so you draw cards. Or you're going to be playing into this field area. When you play into that area, you're bolstering your side and your decision to pick first in this area. However, whenever you play a card, you have to play it in an area where that color is not present. So right now on this ring on this left side, I could not play a purple into the middle and my opponent also could not play a purple because the purple exists on my side of this field here. So it's cool. It's all about getting there first with specific colors and trying to figure out and understand what colors your opponent has so that you can try to stop them. Once these have all six colors, the mandalas break and you're actually going to divvy out those cards to each player. Now, the things I really like about this game are the scoring system. I think it's really interesting. Start of the game, you're going to get two cards of specific colors and then you will try to work your way to make those cards be worth a lot of points. And the way you do this, is every time you collect cards, if it's the first card of a specific color, you'll put it in front of you on the lowest point value. So this player here is scoring one point for their blacks, two for their oranges, three for purple, so on and so forth. And they are trying to collect cards of their higher point values. So it's kind of neat because you're pushing your, your tension and your luck here as you're saying, okay, I need to make sure that I prioritize getting these cards for these specific colors. But if I do, I may not be scoring as much if I'm getting these lower numbers because there's just happens to be more cards at that type in the middle. So like this player here, if you got those three yellows, that'd be fantastic because that'd be worth an extra you know, 18 points for this character. But you know, the other player is going to know that. So they're going to do their best to make sure that the opponent loses this mandala when it breaks so that they get the first pick and can take those themselves. It's a cool tension, a really interesting tug of war. And I think another thing I really enjoy about it is the fact that there are two fields going on at once. So you have to be aware of the results results in both of those fields. It's a lot of fun. I really like the way that this works and it's just a great time. Uh, the only big ding on this game is that it does feel like the same game every time I play. I don't feel like there's a huge amount of variance aside from the cards you're drawing and it can get very lucky. Sometimes you just won't draw the cards you need, but a lot of the times that's it doesn't seem to be a big issue. I think you're drawing enough cards in this game and it's kind of up to you whether you want to push that luck of waiting to see if you may have a color that fits. I think a lot of the times if you you will have an opportunity to play those cards at your hand, it just may not be the time you exactly want to. So, And I think that's where the fun and the tension comes from it. So I think Mandela is a really solid two-player game, one that I really enjoy, great component value. I love the little map that comes in it. It's fantastic. So that's Mandala. Up next, we have Bristol 1350, a, another take that style game that also has to do with hidden roles and escaping a plague. So this can be a game where there are multiple winners or complete losers all around. So in this one, it has this cool little system where you open up a book and it's got a mat in it, a deck of cards and some pieces. At the start of each round, you'll roll some dice and these dice are going to determine which carts move. So on your turn, you get one action and you can either push somebody that's in a cart and try to move to a different one. You can draw some cards that give you special abilities that you can use in future turns, or you have a special action on your own board. And those are kind of all the things you could do. You can move around the cards, you can push things around, and you can even use special powers. The last action I forgot to mention is you can re-roll the dice, because at the end of every round, once everybody's taking their action, those dice are going to determine which cards move. If there are two rats on those dice, you also have to mingle with the people that are in your cart. So you still get to move, but you could potentially become infected. And the infection system works very similar to the game Growl, where if you get a certain number of these cards, these infection values in your hand, you become infected. And once you become infected, if you get, you're always infected. And then at the very end of the game, if you are infected and in a cart with other people, all of you lose. So it's, it is such a weird system because you, once you lose, you lose. There's really nothing you can do about it, and you have to kind of sit through this game and play through it. But that being said, everyone else is really trying to claw their way out. There's a lot of ways to sabotage players by adding high-value infection cards to their decks and their potential mingle pool. And so it's kind of a it's kind of a simulation in take that, but also a lot of randomness and kind of futility, which <laughs> it's a weird system. Very similarly to Cultivate, this has you at the mercy of a lot of players' luck, whether it be the cards that they're drawing from the special remedies deck or or just the dice that are rolled at the start of each round. Sometimes it just might show specific symbols and you're just kind of at the mercy of these dice and other players' actions a lot of the times. Because you only get one action on your turn, you don't have a lot of agency. 
and you're just kind of hoping that everything kind of ends up in your favor at the end of this game. So this game is an interesting experience, but probably not one that I'm going to seek out to play in the future. So that's Bristol 1350. Up next, we played the expansion for Tapestry. This is Arts and Architecture. I rate regular base Tapestry a 7. I think it's fine. I think it's a fun game to play, but has a lot of randomness and can be very swingy. And unfortunately, that does kind of ding it around for me because people feel pretty bad when they do really poorly at this game. And then the player to the left suddenly has 150 more points because of like one random card draw. So it can feel pretty bad, but luckily the game itself is fun to play. It feels good to go up the different tracks, get different abilities, develop your civilization here. So Tapestry Arts and Architectures adds this new track to the game, which honestly doesn't really offer that exciting stuff at the beginning, but later on in the tracks, it's going to offer you some really cool things. So first off, you can get a tapestry card, which sucks because if you need to draw a tapestry card, it means you probably didn't draw a very good one at the start. So hopefully this one's better so that you can do some broke stuff in the next turn. The second one lets you get some points and potential a house of your choice. Points aren't really worth it at the start of the game because you really need to be building an infrastructure, but luckily there's that option for that income building. The last one though is what you're trying to get, and that is creating a masterpiece card. Now masterpiece cards are these square cards, and these square cards are going to give you income whenever you pass. So getting one of those early can be really beneficial. Now a lot of these are going to score you points for specific things. So those might not be very good at the start of the game because you just don't have the stuff that they score for, but there are also some that will provide you victory points and lots of other choices and options, and I really like that. Super awesome in the way that's done. The other thing that you can get on this track are these special income replacements, and the way they work is they literally replace your new income board, which I find really interesting. I thought this would be more of a cool choice than originally presented, but really what it became was you really just pick the income mat that is going to replace the most spaces, because these are just inherently better spaces than the ones that are printed on your main game board. So I don't think that there's a huge amount of choice here. It's kind of a, hey, I am doing this thing, so I'm going to be doing this thing. So it's more of just supplementing the things that you're already doing, which I think is fine because I think that's kind of what this whole track is about. You get a lot of choice in your paths from the other tracks, and I think Arts just kind of supplements all five tracks, which I think makes sense, and I think it has its place in this game. That being said, in practice, this game, this whole expansion feels very natural. I feel like this expansion should have just been included in the base game. It makes sense while adding some non-intrusive elements to the game that do feel like they were just part of the game from the beginning. And I really like that about this. Now, the last two things that they add are these new landmarks, which are going to give you some new blueprint cards. So new starting objective and conditions. And I really like that. And then one more thing that it adds are new land types. So instead of having your base game mat, you're going to have some sort of challenge you'll need to overcome or something that you can function with. Like last time I had a sky city. So I had all these tetromino pieces that I had to fill instead of the standard nine boxes. And I thought that was an interesting little challenge. So cool stuff here. Lots of ways to vary your game play. I think that this is a very solid expansion, especially if you really like Tapestry already. It's a natural fit. Up next, we have Trajan, a wonderful game by Stefan Feld, and I can see why it is so well loved. This is a game of Mancala style, where on your turn, you pick a group of tokens, pass them around your board in a circular fashion, and wherever you land, that's the action that you could get. There are these tiles that you can trade in in order to get special abilities if you have matching colors, and then based on where you land, you take a cool action on the board. You can get more of these tiles you can trade in, you can get some bonus action tiles, you can get some demand tiles, or you can send out soldiers in order to go explore, you can go take out these architecture buildings, or you could do some trades by trading goods. Now this game in particular, I think, is just really, really smooth in its systems. It feels good to play on your turn, it's very straightforward and simple how it works. You're constantly planning to try to receive and those bonuses on those Trajan tiles, and it makes so much sense. I love the different competition of the different areas. There's a lot of first come, first serve on the tokens and tiles, so every path is viable, and every path is important, and I think that's really sweet how it plays out in this game. Now, my favorite part about this game has to be the different scoring conditions. So at the end of every round, you are going to vote to see who has the highest in the Senate seat, and that is determined through votes you've collected or or through the Senate action track that has this little counter at the bottom here that it, you have the most there, you just get to pick one of these tiles first. They're these large yellow tiles, and these will give you some sort of end game scoring. So I really like that. If you're first, you get first dibs, but if you're second, you get the leftover one, but you also will flip it over and it becomes a weaker version of itself. So I really like that that's built into the game, and it's going to have you exploring different facets of the design. This is a really cool game with surprising amount of fun, quick, comboing actions and it just is really satisfying to play that is trajan one that i'm excited to play some more of 
Up next, we have the game Teotihuacan City of Gods. I got to play more of the new expansion, the expansion period. This is the one that introduces the new obsidian to the game. These are wild resources, and it replaces a lot of the resource bases from the original game. And I really like this. I think that it's just a natural fit, and it's non-intrusive in the way it works with those obsidian tiles. We also tried some of the new characters, and my gosh, I got slaughtered in this game. If you're not familiar with base Teotihuacan, the whole idea is you're building this pyramid, and you're doing that through a rondel style, and you'll be putting characters onto places and when you build pyramids you're trying to match symbols which get you points and you're trying to help. So there's lots of different avenues to points but the center of the board has this giant pyramid you're building that's going to let you go up on tracks. So many different things to do. So many ways to get points through tiles or through building or through building decorations. You could honestly probably ignore the pyramid and do other things too but the pyramid is a cool one. Now the first expansion of the game offered new player abilities and this expansion also comes with them and we had seen an ability that we hadn't seen before. It may have been in the base game. Who knows? But the ability said that every time you get a point, you get an extra point. Excuse me? It was pretty ridiculous. So first turn, uh, the person I was playing with, my friend Eric, he had just suddenly shot up, I think, like 150 points in like the first round of the game because he was just earning little points here and there. He had some starting tiles that gave him some technology that just accelerated his plays forward. He had this cool combo with that technology to just get a bunch of cocoa so he didn't really have to worry about feeding. It was insane. I tried really hard in this game, and I just couldn't come back from such a demanding lead that he took early. And whoa, it was an experience, but it was a fun one. I had a great time with it. Teotihuacan still remains to be just a fantastic game with a lot of smooth gameplay, fun combos, fun abilities, and just a constant amount of decisions that all lead up to satisfying gameplay. I love this game. I think it's super well done, and it's one that I'm excited to play more of. So that's Teotihuacan. The last game I want to talk about is Assassin's Creed Brotherhood of Venice. A huge surprise at how great this game is. Now, this is based off of the Assassin's Assassin's Creed universe, where you're a group of assassins going through stealth missions to try to fulfill all sorts of different objectives for your brotherhood's ultimate purpose. So I'm not really sure what that is yet. I'm about seven, eight, nine missions in this game, but wow, what a great system and what a great experience. So this game has you setting up these large tiles onto the board, and every time you do so, you'll be populated with miniatures, maps, items, and objective tokens. Now, right off the bat, this may seem extremely daunting. I love this system, though, because pretty much all these tiles are interchangeable. There's water tiles, there's roof tiles, and there's like house tiles and street tiles, and that's it. So there's four types of tiles, and it's really easy to set them up. You just put the correct colors, and you put them in the correct orientation, and that's it. It's awesome because you don't need to be searching through large stacks for specific tiles. You're just looking for a specific type of tile, and I think that's really nice. It does help with setting up that game and actually getting you started, so I really like how the boards are built in this game. In addition, a lot of the enemies start are going to be deployed during the game as opposed to at the start, so it's not going to start like this, which means getting into it is nice and breezy. Also, this game's tutorial mission system is really well done. You're going to have a set of four kind of mini memories that explain all the mechanisms to you and introduce slowly the game to it until you finally get into that full mission breath. And the mission gameplay loop is really, really fun. So before the mission even begins, you have a headquarter phase where you're doing a mini worker placement game to prep for the mission at hand. You can use them to complete kind of these mini quests, and then you actually go out into the memory. During the memory, you have an event phase where something will happen. You'll have a action phase where you'll get to move around the board, assassinate people, uh, try to not be detected, and then you'll have the enemy phase where they'll move around and try to attack you. And this is just so well done. It's so smooth, and I just really enjoy this system. There's a lot of planning that goes into this. You have asynchronous turns here so that you can say, hey, let's go ahead and you do your thing, I'll do this, and let's see how, I, how my results pan out. That way, maybe you can do something to respond. There's a lot of neat stuff you can do here, and it brings a lot of the mechanics and mechanisms from the video games into this. Now, I'm not a huge Assassin's Creed fan. I've played the Black Flag game uh, for a little bit. I uh, don't really like video games. It's not something I find myself gravitating towards a lot, but this really captures that feeling in a really neat board game style. I really like the solo. I really like the cooperative modes of this game. It offers ways to communicate and work together, and the incognito and hiding and stealth system works really well. The way it works is when you get into a space with people, you roll dice for each person, and the dice have three results. You either are detected, you are not detected, or you are detected if you're on alert, which means that people have already found you and they know you're here, so they're kind of looking for you. So as soon as you become detected that first time, it can be really dangerous to be found later. And I really like that system. So it just works extremely, extremely well. I am having a blast with this, and every time you play it, it feels like Christmas, because you're going to open up an envelope, and you've got new cards, new equipment, new things that you're going to be looking at, and new mechanisms that are introduced. And it's just such a blast. I really enjoy this experience, and it's one that I'm going to see 
see myself playing a lot. It's been stuck to my table now for about a week and a half, and I just see myself playing a lot of it over this holiday season. So having a blast with Assassin's Creed Brotherhood of Venus. What a fantastic game. So those are the 10 mini reviews for this episode of what we've been playing. Let's go ahead and quickly run through all 39 unique titles. So the first game is Final Girl, Spyfall, Downforce, Tiny Towns, No Thanks, Corrosion, Maracaibo, Bullet, Parade, Hollertau, Glory to Rome, Cultivate, Chronicles of Drunagor, Las Vegas Royale, Mandala, Marvel Legendary, Ink and Gold, So Clover, Team 3, Nemesis, Bristol 1350, Blood Rage, Tapestry 10, Ethnos, Point Salad, Trajan, Super Fantasy Brawl, Teotihuacan, Marvel Champions, Dune Imperium, Telestrations, Micro Macro, Crime City, Full House, 5 Minute Marvel, Assassin's Creed, Brotherhood of Venice, Fort, Lost Ruins of Arnak, The Crew, Quest for Planet 9, and finally, coconuts so these are all the games from those past two weeks what games have you been playing i'd love to hear what your opinions are on these games we discussed here or just any of those games i listed at the end what have you been playing and what are you excited to play for next week i'd love to hear what you think but thank you so much for sticking around and watching side game strong